right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring Weather Studio Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, really excited to be hosting these live uh, conservation events. So it is now time for animals to take fate into their own paws. The Endangered is the first book in a thrilling new adventure series by world-renowned environmentalist and Emmy-nominated host of Exploration Awesome Planet, Philippe Cousteau, and award-winning Turbo Racers author, Austin Aslan. We're teaming up with Earth Echo International and the World Wildlife Fund to host a series of virtual events this month, uh, diving deeper into real world conservation uh, and the threats that species do uh, face. We're focusing on uh, species featured in the first of the endangered series, the polar bear, the orangutan, the narwhal, the pangolin, uh, and the black-footed ferret. All right, well, let's get today's event rolling. So we're really excited to be joined uh, by Philippe Cousteau today, grandson of the legendary Jacques Cousteau. He's a television host, author, speaker, and founder of Earth Echo International, an amazing uh, conservation organization uh, encouraging uh, youth to get involved uh, in important issues around the world. So let's bring uh, Philippe in live here. Hey, Philippe, how are you doing today? I'm terrific, Joe. Thanks for having me. Delighted to yeah. see everybody. Great to see you. We've got a big group of classrooms joining us live on camera. I can see tons of comments coming in via YouTube. So we have lots of students tuning in live there as well. Uh, we're hitting the halfway point. I mean, this, this series has been a ton of fun uh, and we're excited to dive into our next uh, group today. Indeed, well, today is a, is a really special day, Joe. Um, the orangutan character, a reef in the endangered um, here right here, they the, got the book with me right here, is is kind of the heart and soul of the team. And I was just gonna read a, a, a couple pages from one of the chapters that features his perspective for you all to, to enter into the world of the endangered with us for the next 40, 50 minutes or so. Chapter 30, Woomph, thunk, woomph. The vacuum was working, nabbing the prairie dogs one after another, thinning the horde. But still, the vacuum pack wasn't enough. The overwhelming crush of critters had brought the orangutan to his knees. He cried out in pain as the rodents chomped. He pulled them off, tossed them away, but they were like boomerangs, popping straight up and hurling, hurling themselves right back at him. A reef rose to his feet, bellowing his best Sumatran howl. He spun in a circle and shed the varmints like a lawn sprinkler. Sheridan sucked up most of them on the fly. The wire and mesh balloon on the back of Sheridan's pack filled to max capacity. He slammed a button on his shoulder strap and the sack ejected. Without missing a beat, the rancher punched another button and a new inflatable cartridge locked into place. Prairie dogs shot into the new balloon. Rapid fire. The sack expanded as it filled. Bleeding and dazed, the reef finally flicked the last of the prairie dogs away. And Sheridan was right there to suck it up. You all right, the rancher yelled. Nothing a few hundred band-aids can't fix, the reef sighed. Sheridan shut off the vacuum. The tunnel was suddenly strikingly quiet. Let's get a move on, he yelled before realizing he was being unnecessarily loud. They'll come at us faster than I can suck them up. Soon enough, I've only got five balloon canisters on board. A reef pointed at the discarded balloon full of prey dogs. Are they going to suffocate in there? Nah, they'll chew through the pouch. The wire mesh will keep them contained, though. I could have a, um, he revealed, showing a reef a switch attached to one of the pack's shoulder straps. Sheridan shrugged and clipped the swallows back. They raced forward, following the overhead lights, taking a left, then a right, then another left, and a downward jog. Finally, they came to the side of a tunnel. Arif hoped his passage would lead it back up to where they had lost sight of Nikilik. They jogged along it, along it, coming to an antechamber tall enough for both of them to stand fully upright. At the back of the nook, rising three feet tall, was a round wooden door branded at the center with a Q inside of a larger circle. Um... So that's just one of the scenes of the action towards the end of the book where Arif is um, fighting against these uh, brainwashed prairie dogs. No prairie dogs were harmed in the, that scene, but um, um, they finally make it to that door and, and discover the villain that's behind all the shenanigans in the book. Um, so Arif is, a, is, as I said, the leader of the group, is the core and the backbone of it. And that character was inspired by an experience that I had um, in Sumatra, that's why Arif is actually a Sumatran orangutan, not a Bornean orangutan. Um, and the, the, whole in, uh, the, the whole story is that I was filming a, a series with CNN called Expedition Sumatra, and we were filming at an orangutan uh, rehab sanctuary. Now, the various different heroes in the book were chosen because their backgrounds are 
good examples of some of the biggest threats that endangered species are facing, right? So Nuclelic, the polar bear is facing problems in, in um, uh, uh, the Arctic sea ice melting in the Arctic, which is of course the climate change issue. And a reef is facing an issue in Sumatra. His background is from deforestation and the illegal pet trade. And, um, and so uh, I was visiting a, a place in Sumatra that actually rehabilitates um, uh, baby orangutans that have been rescued from the illegal pet trade. And um, I was filming there for several days in the middle of the jungle. And it was a really a, a, a touching experience. And Joe, I emailed you a photo. I don't know if you can put it up, but um, uh, I have a photograph of myself with uh, a baby orangutan named Violetta who had been rescued from the illegal pet trade. And one scene that I remember, um, I was in, uh, uh, we were filming and the, the crew was there, the, my, my whole crew filming it. And one of the ways that they rehabilitate these animals back into the, the wild is they have to teach them how to live in the wild. And the way babies learn is from mimicking their mothers. And so um, the, the trainers or the, the, the rehabilitators there have to show them the, the types of behavior that the orangutans have to know how to do um, through show and tell. One of the things that they eat there are termites and it's a good source of protein. So I'm standing there and we're talking about this with the head of the Franklin Zoological Society um, Rehabilitation Center. And he reaches down into a, a piece of rotted wood and breaks off a piece and brings it up. And he says, so uh, in the wild, the orangutans have to uh, suck the termites out of the, the, the wood. And um, uh, so, so we have to do that to show them how to do it. And there's Violetta hanging in the tree. I don't know if the, the picture is working. Um, but, uh, uh, and she's looking at me intently. And there's these termites crawling all over this piece of wood. And the researcher shows me how to do it. And he sucks in, and there's termites on his face. I'm like, oh my goodness, what is going on here? And then he says, now your turn. Um, so the camera's rolling and this baby orangutan right next to me is like staring at me with these big expectant eyes. And I'm like, oh boy. So um, so I, what do you do? I took the, took the piece of rotted wood and put it up to my face and started sucking sucking in the holes, the termites out. And they were all over my face, crawling in my beard, it tasted like mouth, mouthful of sawdust and termites. But the payoff was that this orangutan was looking at me and she reached over with her hand and took the piece of wood out of her hand and still with her eyes looking at me, took her lips and, and sucked the, the termites out of the wood as well. So that was, um, that was worth it. I think it was a little bit of a, of a, of a mea culpa. I'm sorry for my species to have done this to you. So the least I could do is, is try and help teach you how to live in the wild. Anyway, those are my, that was one of my wonderful experiences and was the backbone and, and, and the inspiration for a reef as the key character of the endangered. So uh, thrilled today to, 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 to dig into this incredible, extraordinary animal with you and the story behind them. Um, so let's get moving. I think Joe. Well, I'll just work on that out. Um, so uh, yeah, the, the the basic idea, the backstory, which we don't actually, oh, hey Joe, how's it going? Yeah, sorry gang. Uh, Philippe, I went to load the picture, but I think I have way too many things running on my computer. So I got the spinning wheel of doom. Uh oh. Uh, so I had no to wait for that to, to calm down, but we did, we did get that spinning wheel away. And I do believe I can show the picture now. So there we go. Oh, uh, there we go. See that yes. picture from so the there is, um, there's Violetta uh, turning around and looking at the camera uh, and the lights. But uh, that was right after that scene where I sucked the termites. So I kind of have a disconcerted look on my face, but it was still a great experience. So anyway. All right. Very cool. Well, Philippe, thank you for sharing that story and the reading from the book. We're going to bring you back in shortly for a little bit of Q&A action. But I think it's time that we meet our guest today, Justin. Yes. So let's see here, let's get things swapping out. There we go. All right. Well, I'm thrilled today to introduce Justin Grubb. He recently spent time in Indonesia working with an organization called Planet Indonesia, where he was able to document some of the work they're doing to protect uh, the Bornean orangutan. So Justin is a host and producer whose passion for wildlife and education has led him uh, to documentary filmmaking. With two friends, he started Running Wild Media with an expertise in conservation biology, international travel, and filmmaking. So they've traveled all around the world filming and creating content uh, that tells stories of adventure, travel, and conservation.
Justin, I've had the privilege of hosting you in a, a few wild places around the world, including Borneo, I think yeah. out at night uh, with Rangers, which is pretty cool. Uh, but it's great to have you live joining us today. Yeah, well, it's great to be here. And uh, love talking about one of my favorite animals. So I'm excited to share uh, some information and some stories I have from the field. Great. So share screen with you guys. All right. Awesome. So I'd like to, to begin with a story that I have um, with the first time I've ever seen a, an orangutan in the wild. And I mean, this was an incredible experience that I'll never forget. So there I was in Southern Borneo and, you know, with wildlife filmmaking, it takes a lot of patience and a lot of time. So I had, I was sitting on the ground in an area where um, the guide that I was with said would have a decent chance of having orangutans. So he'd saw, he'd seen them there a day or two before. And so we were hoping that this would be a really good spot. Uh, so I was sitting on the ground, I had all my camera stuff set up, my telephoto lens, my tripod, um, and I had some plants and stuff kind of covered me to sort of camouflage myself um, in the bush so that things wouldn't see me. And after about 30 minutes of after setting up, you know, the rainforest started really coming alive again. And it's actually a really cool thing. Uh, and I did encourage students at home to try this, to go out into the woods around their house and just sit quietly for 30 minutes and you'd be amazed at everything that kind of comes back to life after this big awkward human is done walking through the rainforest or the forest, um, trancing through all the underbrush. So after about 30 minutes, everything started coming alive. The insects were buzzing, the occasional gibbon would sound off. Um, and I was just sitting there super excited, adrenaline going, and there was nothing. We were just <laughs> sitting there staring at empty trees. So about after two hours, three hours of just sitting there with my camera gear, you know, you start to kind of get bored. You look at the leaves, you look at the ground. Um, and we started hearing some leaves rustling and some branches breaking. And, you know, it's, it's a really distinct sound because orangutans are the heaviest, largest tree dwelling animals in the entire world. So, you know, when you hear a specific sound, you know, there's something big coming. And I'm like getting excited. I look over at my guide and he's just like, you know, excitedly shaking his head. So that means, you know, something, something's happening, something's coming. So I get all set up, ready to go. Adrenaline's going again. And then nothing. It stops. And I'm sitting there again for about 45 minutes, just kind of waiting in anticipation. And again, you kind of just start like kind of easing back into, into it. Then again, all of a sudden, branches were breaking, leaves were smashing, and then I get excited again. I look over at the guide, same face. He's like, thumbs up. Um, so I know it's a good sign. And then the branches come crashing down onto the forest floor. And in this big spot, there's this big open branching area with a tree. This female comes swinging in, and I could see a little baby clinging to her fur. She swings down. I'm madly taking photos, and then she sits in the tree with her back facing me. <laughs> And so I'm still taking photos. It's my first encounter. I'm not sure what to expect. Um, the back of an animal is still exciting to me because it's the first time I've ever been in the presence of an orangutan. So I quietly take my photos and my videos and then I just kind of sit there and wait. She just has her back to me, looking around, looking around. Another 30 minutes goes by. You know, I've got enough pictures of the orangutan's back that I think I'm okay. Uh, maybe about a 800 or so. And then she finally spins around and looks around and she opens up her arms and this little baby, this beautiful little baby sitting there just looking around. And I start snapping away um, very quietly. I had my silence uh, shutter on, so it didn't make a lot of noise. And she just sat there for about 10 minutes, just kind of enjoying the scene that I've enjoyed over the last several hours, waiting for her to show up. Um, and it was an amazing experience. I never moved the entire time. I was very quiet, very still. Um, but I knew she saw me because she never looked directly at me. <laughs> so none of my photos, I have her looking at me. She's always just kind of looking around passively looking, but I knew she knew me that I was there. Um, and it was really interesting observing her because the mannerisms, the movements, they were very human-like. You know, you can look into her eyes, you could see her relationship with the baby. And it reminded me very much of what humans do, the relationships that humans have, mothers have with their babies. 
And, you know, a couple of times during this experience, she would allow her baby to nurse. Um, and you could see kind of on her belly there, she's got milk. The baby made a whole mess of everything. Um, and then at the end of that, she got up, she swung, swung away, and, uh, and that was it. But, like, the really important part of that was just that moment, that moment we had together, you know, spending time together in the forest. But it was respectful. You know, I was at a distance. I was quiet. I didn't do anything to change her behavior. I didn't move my shot. I just sat there. Um, and that's really the best way to form a relationship with wildlife through photography is to keep distance be respectful, allow them to be as natural as they possibly can. And I was absolutely rewarded with um, a sequence of images of her and this baby. And I think it was, it's really nice to show that relationship uh, between her and her offspring, because like Philippe said, they have such an important bonding period of time where the baby learns so much from the mother. Um, that's really, really important for their survival. So in order to get there, I had to go through quite a bit. I had to be on a boat for about four days. And this is kind of what the boat looked like. It was deep, dark, dense jungle, very, very dark. Um, rivers all throughout this entire ecosystem. And so you can kind of get an idea and an appreciation for why these animals live in the trees. It's because the ground is soggy and wet and covered in water a lot of the times out of the year. So four days on the boat, I would occasionally get off to hike and try to find some terrestrial wildlife like bearded pigs or orangutans. But most of the time I was on this boat uh, staring at proboscis monkeys and river animals. We ate on the boat, slept on the boat, lived on the boat. And so here's just another quick shot of the, uh, the rainforest that we worked with. I'm trying to get this to, to click here. So that's a really good shot of the misty rainforest that you can kind of see that we were working with. And so I want to talk a little bit about where I was and what I was working with in relation to um, a reef, the Sumatran orangutan. So I was primarily with Bornean orangutans, and both islands are part of the country Indonesia. The Bornean orangutans live on the island of Borneo, and they have a pretty nice, robust population. They're all critically endangered. But of the three, the Borean orangutan has the largest population. A reef is the Sumatran orangutan. So he is found over here on the, um, the northwest tip of the island of Sumatra. Now, what's interesting, there is a third species of orangutan that was recently discovered in 2017. So it's kind of interesting to say that, you know, we're still making massive discoveries on really charismatic, large animals. And, you know, even up until the 90s, they were all considered just the same species. Uh, but really, DNA evidence has shown that there's three distinct species. And so the Tapanelli orangutans diverged from Bornean and Sumatran orangutans before Bornean and Sumatran orangutans diverged from each other. So they were separated from the main population due to a volcanic eruption. And then the Sumatran and the Bornean orangutans continue to interact and then when the ice or the, the, the sea levels rose due to the end of the ice age, it caused the separation of these different islands and cut the population in half. And so your vocab word of the day is called allopatric speciation, where a geographical event causes the separation of a population, cutting them off from one another, and then they're on their own to sort of evolve and um, do their own thing. So... All of these three populations, they have slight differences, cultural differences. Um, and the Tapanuli orangutans seem to have a little bit of the most difference with like canine structure, skull structure, all of that good stuff. And so for the rest of this presentation, I'll give you a couple interesting orangutan facts and show you some really cool photos that I have of orangutans. This is a male orangutan. You could see by the flanges on the side of his face there, the big cheek pads. Female orangutans find those just absolutely irresistible. And so they're looking for males that are big, they're chunky, they've got those big flanges. Um, and they also have a really big throat sack that they use to do a roaring call 
to communicate with other orangutans in the forest. And that's how they communicate, which is which says a lot. You know, the rainforest is thick, it's dense, there's lots of insects and birds all communicating. So in order to break that noise, these males have to have massive, massive throat pouches, and they can get their sounds carrying miles and miles through the rainforest, which is amazing. And like I said before, they're the largest tree-dwelling animal or arboreal species. Um, the males can get as heavy as 290 pounds. So imagine a 290 pound animal swinging from the trees. Um, that's an incredible thing, you know, and the strength and the confidence that they have doing so is incredible. The male orangutans also have a little bit more of a beard, whereas the females don't have much of a beard. They've got a little bit of scruff going on. Um, the males, they have that, that really cool, really cool beard. The Sumatran orangutans are a little bit smaller than the Bornean orangutans. The Borneans get a little bit bigger, um, and you can find Bornean orangutans kind of crossing the ground occasionally as well. So this is another male hanging from a tree, and I like this photo because it shows how crazy their limbs are. You can see that's its foot gripping the branch just like it would with its hands, and they have extremely long bones in their hands so they can grab really thick thick branches to kind of support their weight as they're working through uh, the rainforest. So orangutans, they're a little bit more solitary than other apes are. They don't live in large troops like gorillas or chimpanzees. The males will travel around by themselves. Females will typically travel around with uh, their babies. Um, occasionally they'll get together, but most of the time they're pretty solitary. They'll eat 400 different types of foods in the rainforest. They have a very diverse diet. Um, they'll eat fruits primarily, but also leaves, um, reptiles, bird eggs, termites, like uh, Fleet mentioned. Um, they're always looking for a very, very diet, which, which means that they, they rely on primary old rainforest that has that diversity of foods that they need in order to survive. So they're looking for variety, looking for all kinds of stuff. Um, another really cool thing about orangutans is that they use tools and they build beds and they build pillows and they'll even use um, umbrellas, you know, if it's raining out in the jungle. And so here's a cool shot of just how confidently they move through the rainforest. This is a female with a baby just swinging on a dead tree. And then this is another guy. He's hanging from one arm, just eating with his other one. Um, you can see this small group here, uh, the baby still clinging to the female. And they'll do that for about six, you know, they'll do that for a year or two. And then they'll stay with the mom for about six to eight years um, throughout their life. So they'll, they'll milk off of the mom for about four months. And then at that point, the mom will chew up food and um, give it to the baby. And then the baby will start working towards more solid food. But most of the shots I have are the orangutans foraging and eating because it is amazing how much time they actually spend eating. Um, they eat a lot, they forage a lot, and when they're not doing that, they're just relaxing in their, their hammocks, um, just kind of chilling out, which is pretty cool. Um, another thing is there are some predators of orangutans. There are tigers and clouded leopards. So at one point in history, tigers were a predator for them. Not so much in Borneo because the tiger no longer lives there, but a lot of leopards will also go for um, orangutans if given the chance. But here's again another baby clinging to her mom, which is pretty cool. Um, and you can see just how close that relationship is between the two. I like this photo a lot because it shows just how furry orangutans are. And um, they have a lot of texture. They've got like a grayish skin, a lot of texture with their, their fur. Their fur can change between like a bright orange to like a dark maroon reddish color. So uh, it's got some variation there. And something that surprises me is how loose and baggy their skin is. Um, I was surprised by that when I saw them uh, for the first time. They just seem to have skin hanging everywhere, which is pretty crazy. So orangutans have a lot of threats um, in their natural range. And we'll start with the top right image you see here. And I like this image a lot because it kind of shows the juxtaposition between their main threat, deforestation due to palm oil and their native habitat. So you could see the diversity of trees 
the quality of rainforest habitat there that shows the diversity of foods that the orangutan would be able to find. Um, you know, and that's a habitat that would be really good for orangutans. They spread the seeds of countless trees because of their diets. And that helps maintain the diversity of the forest. And that's beneficial for reptiles, amphibians, birds, insects, everything you can imagine all rely on these orangutans spreading these seeds. And so when you look at this habitat and you look at the difference between what the habitat looks like here, it's a complete monoculture, the same trees. And that is almost a desert for these organisms and for the orangutan. And so that is one of their biggest issues in the wild is deforestation because of the development of palm oil plantations. In addition, you've got um, forest fires, which a lot of the times get out of control. Um, when people go and they try to clear out habitat, the easiest way for them to do that is forest fire. It's almost impossible to get bulldozers and equipment out there into the mountains to clear the trees. So they just light them on fire and the fires start getting out of control and then they burn a lot of a lot of habitat. And the smoke disorients animals, um, it confuses everything and it makes it very difficult for these animals to breathe. The big issue with that is these rainforests all across the world, if you look across the equator, they sequester tons and tons of carbon annually. And not only when you reduce the amount of forests, you're losing that ability to lock down carbon out of the atmosphere, but when you burn them, you're releasing all of that carbon back into the atmosphere that that forest had sucked in over the past decades and hundreds of years. And so that is compounding climate change when you're talking about losing the forest and burning it. Another issue is illegal logging, you know, obviously for building the houses, pollution, top left photo, this is a river that is right next to the park that I was in uh, with the orangutans. There's tons of plastic pollution everywhere. And then like Philippe mentioned, the illegal wildlife trade. People think that it's cool to have orangutans as pets. And so they'll go and they'll take them from their moms. The important thing is to remember that it takes six to eight years for an orangutan with its mom to understand how to be an orangutan and to learn what it needs to to survive in the jungle. When you take that baby away, it's not getting the proper nutrition first and foremost, but also it never learns how to be an orangutan. So it lives its whole life confused and scared and unsure of what to do. So that brings us to the solution section. So, you know, humans and orangutans have been living together for tens of thousands of years. You know, human communities have been in the shadow of orangutan habitat and it seemed who have worked out, you know, orangutans are still with us. And so, you know, that brings the question, what happened? Well, one of the big things that happened is population. So Indonesia is one of the most populous countries in the entire world. And the human population has just exploded in that area. And that human population requires agricultural and places to live. And so that's reduced the orangutan population. Another big thing is inequality in inequities that have caused the exploitation of these valuable habitats. And when people need to find a way of living, they often resort to activities that are damaging to the environment. And so Planet Indonesia is an incredible organization that works with these communities to help protect the forests and the wildlife that live in these important areas. So they have a lot of really, really cool programs. One of them are community cooperatives where um, these communities can form this cooperative where they have access to loans and alternative business practices. Um, the top left image there it shows um, one of those business practices of reforestation where communities are growing saplings and outplanting them. And over the last several years, we've, um, seeded about 125,000 of these saplings and really brought back a tremendous amount of rainforest habitat, for not just the orangutan, but for hornbills, for gibbons, and for all sorts of really cool Indonesian wildlife. Some other programs that they have going on are like education programs where um, communities will learn how to do sustainable farming, organic farming, um, as well as learn to read, learn to um, learn various life skills, and then health programs where, you know, these communities have access to better health. And when a community has better health programs, 
the overall community does better, which they're not as reliant upon the native ecosystem for that. In addition to community development, Planet Indonesia does a lot of really unique research um, on the forest and protection services of the forest. So they have something called Smart Patrols, which is where I um, talked to Joe for the first time in Borneo. I brought out a satellite and I was on one of these Smart Patrols where the rangers go around and they look at the ecosystem around the rainforest and pinpoint what's happening, human activities, um, and that allows them to build an understanding of what villages need, what areas, and that better serves the villages. Um, another program is the biodiversity team where they go out and they look at different species in the rainforest, they'll do transects, they'll listen for bird songs, they'll collect plant species. Um, and it gives us an interesting set of data to where we could see what we're doing with the communities and compare that to what's happening with the dynamic of the ecosystem around these communities and see how they're benefiting. And so far, um, it's been great. You know, the, the ecosystem that, that exists near these communities that we work with, the animals are coming back, the forests are getting more, more robust. Um, so it's been great. And so really, these people that you see here, these are the faces of conservation. You know, 2% of indigenous communities are in charge of 80% of the world's biodiversity. So when it comes to solving climate change and mitigating biodiversity loss, these are the faces, these are the people that are making that happen. And so by working with these communities, you're really, really putting a lot of effort into solving those issues by addressing the root causes of the threats to these wildlife. And so the important thing here is that when human populations and villages and communities thrive, so does wildlife, so does biodiversity. So by addressing community needs, you're really addressing the whole picture and building a more sustainable future where we can solve a lot of these issues like climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, and stuff like that. And so what are some things that you guys can do at home to help with uh, orangutan conservation? Well, one of the biggest things you could do is avoid products that are using palm oil, um, which is very difficult, I will say. Uh, you can go around your house after this presentation and try to identify products that, you know, have palm oil and you'll find that most of them do. So I think a, a, a good alternative is to do your homework on companies um, that use sustainable palm, palm oil. And I'll give an example of one. You guys are familiar with M&Ms, Snickers. Um, they have done a lot of work to choose palm oil plantations that are sustainable, that set aside land for habitat regeneration, as well as pay their workers competitive salaries. So there's no human rights violations there. So that's a really good one to look into, but there's more. Um, and push for better labeling because palm oil can be listed as 20 different chemicals in the ingredients. So it's very confusing and hard to understand where to find out what what's in the what's in the product you're looking at. And another thing you could do is support programs that are working to protect orangutans. And so with that, here's our website and here are all the ways that you guys can connect with Planet Indonesia. Um, we're on social media and all kinds of stuff. Um, one really cool, interesting thing is that Planet Indonesia is starting to work in an area called Gunung Nani. And that's like a mountainous region in central Borneo and West Kalimantan. That area has the largest, most robust Bornean orangutan population. And so working in that area, implementing all the programs that I just mentioned are a great way that we're going to help protect the species for the future. All right. Thank you, Justin. That was great. I loved uh that video of just watching them move through the trees it doesn't look like it should be possible it looks like the branches should break or uh they're just a little too confident let me bring philippe back in here there we go the crew together it's true justin that was that was an extraordinary presentation thank you i um it brings back so many memories of my experience for a couple of weeks in sumatra uh it didn't take four days on a boat but we were on a the most incredible off-road vehicle i've ever seen and it took us about a day and a half to get up to the to the location where we were filming in Jambi province in Sumatra. Um, and, and to echo what you were saying, the, the, the amount of um, devastation from that palm oil industry and the frustrating point of, of the fact that um, it's really seen as a, you know, as a, as a short-term gain. There's a reason that I think it's something like six or seven of the richest families in Indonesia are um, agricultural or palm oil and, and pulp and paper. 
Um, and you're right in that what we were seeing was, uh, you know, a lack of a lot of that wealth trickling down to the local people in the local community. So it's oftentimes this false promise, as we always see when there's um, saying, you know, when, when big corporations come in and say, oh, allow us to, you know, devastate your local community and you'll get jobs out of it. Um, but that oftentimes wasn't the case at any level of sustainability. And what we saw at the Frankfurt Zoological Society is they were actually employing the local community to um, to enforce and protect the protected areas, which was a much more sustainable long term. I'll give you a great example. Um, one of the stories that we heard about from a local community is that that the um, the Japanese government had come in to build a reservoir um, to provide stable water supply for them, um, but the commitment was that they were not allowed to cut the rainforest that was above and or surrounding this reservoir, because as we know, forests are natural reservoirs for attracting water and also holding soil in place. Well, unfortunately, after a couple of years, um, they ignored that requirement. And the governor of the province came in, got a lot of money for this, and, and cut down all the forests above the reservoir on that mountainside and planted palm oil. Um, well, a big storm came through and there were massive mudslides and they came in and blot and filled in the entire reservoir and destroyed the whole system. Um, and, uh, and all of a sudden these people had no access to clean water. So, uh, you know, when we destroy the local environment, we, there, there are very real consequences. Oftentimes the local communities are the ones that suffer. Um, and, and in addition to the palm oil, what we saw a lot in Sumatra, I'm not as familiar with Borneo, um, but I know in, in Sumatra, one of the big issues is pulp and paper plantations where they'll basically do the same thing. They cut down the rainforests and they'll plant acacia, which is a fast growing plant that is a tree that is oftentimes used to create um, uh, paper products, right? Virgin paper products, everything from toilet paper, paper towels, printer paper. And it seemed to me like an un, un, unequal um, trade off that you can have cheap toilet paper um, in return for the destruction of the environment of these of these remarkable creatures. And so um, that was another big problem in, in Indonesia, actually, in Sumatra anyway, was the pulp and paper plantations that we filmed. Um, so I, uh, and, and a couple examples of stuff, there's, there's of course, candy chocolate, things like that with palm oil, but also lipstick and creams, um, all sorts of stuff in your home has uh, potato chips. I mean, all sorts of stuff has palm oil in it because uh, as an oil, it's, um, it's really interesting, the thermal properties of palm oil you can really pro literally like program it to melt at different heat temperatures. Um, why some chocolate, you know, they melt in your mouth, not in your hand, because literally they're designed so that they don't melt at 90, say 95 degrees or 94 degrees, they melt at 98 degrees. Um, so palm oil is a very, very useful oil in that respect, but there is a lot of marginal land. Um, palm, palm oil, I believe, come from Africa. There's a lot of places in Africa that, that are much more appropriate for palm oil. Um, and, uh, so there is, there is the ability to grow palm oil sustainably, sustainably and not uh, clear cut forest, but, um, that was really wonderful. And, and I encourage all of you to, to check out planet Indonesia. I mean, these are the kinds of organizations that are on the ground doing terrific work and, um, and, and follow them on Instagram. I know I just did and, uh, and support that maybe a, a, adopt some orangutans and do some things like that at your school that you can, uh, you can do to support them. But Joe, I'm sure we have some questions. You want to go to some classrooms and stuff? No question. We have lots of questions uh, yes. here from some of our groups. So we're going to start off. We're going to go to San Diego. We've got Mrs. Becker uh, representing her virtual class. Let me bring her in. Hey, Mrs. Becker. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for bringing this uh, information to us and to the students. And palm oil. Oh, my gosh. It's in everything. Um, I did want to ask Justin for our class. How close were you when you're shooting these photos? It looked like you were right there, but yet I know camera lenses. So what is a respectful distance for a 290 pound orangutan? Yeah, um, I would say I was probably at about 75 feet um, from the animals when I was filming there. So I did have a telephoto lens and I also had an adapter for the telephoto lens to make it more of a telephoto lens. Um, and that's really important when shooting wildlife. You kind of want to just build that distance um, when it's truly, truly wildlife, you, you don't want to interfere. You don't want to change your behavior a little bit. So I, I did keep a little bit of a distance, but still it was pretty close. You know, I've, I've had wildlife that wouldn't even let me get within like half a mile from them, but these guys were a little bit more tolerant of my presence. All right. Uh, great question to get us started. Mr. Steltzman, sixth graders are joining us in Ontario, Canada. Let's bring them live in here. There we go. Hey, Mr. Steltman. Oh, I think you're on mute, Mr. There we go. 
Go for it, Tim. Uh, so, uh, uh, how many orangutans have you seen? How many orangutans have I seen? Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would say I probably have seen in the wild in Borneo about two dozen orangutans. Um, and that's that's after spending about two weeks with them. So I would say quite a bit, actually, <laughs> for the amount of time I spent in the field. I've had uh, expeditions where I've spent a lot longer in the field and I've seen an animal way less than that. So it was it was pretty good. All right. That is pretty good because I know there's some people who go and they don't see any. So, yeah. uh yeah, definitely lucky. Well, and I, wanted, I wanted to add to that real quick, Joe, about in terms of populations. Um, one of the things we have in the endangered is a at the back of the book is a little bit about each of the different animals, um, the real story about each of these different animals. And just want to read to you here. Um, uh, as Justin said, they're, they're, the population is healthier in Borneo, but still critically endangered. To give you a, a sense of context, there's about 100,000 or so um, uh, orangutans estimated in Borneo. There's only around 7,500 orangutans estimated in Sumatra and less than a thousand of the Tapanuli orangutans left. So that really gives you a sense of, of how critically endangered these animals are. So it's pretty amazing, Justin, that you saw that many when you were there um, because it is it is really hard to, uh, to see them in the wild, not only because they blend in, but because there's just, you know, not nearly as many as there used to be. All right, I'm gonna grab a question off YouTube here. Ms. Keller's group is tuning in in Kansas. Uh, and they have some span questions. They want to know, do you have an idea about the arm span and the lifespan? So they're really into the spans. Well, the spans, all right. So the lifespan, they can live about 60 years. Um, and that's assuming, you know, they have all the resources and everything that they need. That is their genetic potential to live about 60 years. Um, sometimes they'll come in a little under that depending on e ecological pressures and everything. Arm span, I want to say it is about, for a male, it would be about like a six foot person, like laying on their side, even like lar larger than that, probably an eight foot, eight foot span. Um, considering their bodies are very, very short, they're not extremely tall. Um, so they have the longest arm span in relation to their bodies of any, any ape, uh, which is pretty cool. But I want to say about eight feet. And their strength is... Like you can't imagine how strong they are. I remember we were in, in the rehab facility and they had some older orangutans that they were getting ready to release back into the forest. And um, one of these was was over 100 pounds easily and it was a male and he was just sitting there. And I remember we were watching him and he just reached up with one arm onto a branch and just like whoop, pulled himself up and like sat on the branch. And we were just, I mean, it's it's really, their strength is, is unbelievable. <laughs> Yeah, it takes a lot to do all those pull-ups for a human to try to do that in an orangutan. It's like one pinky, whoop. Or, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they would absolutely smash rock climbing competitions for sure. All right. And also another cool fact about orangutans that I love, Justin, you probably speak more to it, is just how like their lips are prehensile. I mean, literally their lips, they use their lips to be able to manipulate food and open things. And like they are, they're, they're so... Um, um, agile and, and flexible with their, I mean, it's, it's watching them eat and their hands and their feet, they eat with both. Um, they're really, a, a, an amazing animal to, to witness. Yeah. Some of the video, I, you can see the lips kind of work and, uh, peel the bananas off and the various fruit they were eating. It's, they're incredible to watch. All right. Let's bring in Miss Carton's group in Alaska. Hey, Miss Carton, how are you? Doing great. Thank you so much for having us. I am going to come over and take a look and through Zoom. So let me see who is ready really quick to ask a question. Let me see. I'm going to see if... Oh. Well, then let me take you over. I'm going to head over to our chat then. Um, we have a, a document that we have been... Uh, collecting questions for. So I have a question, I have a question for either of you. Um, how do you convince the wealthy people who make money on palm oil to change their ways? And even just the local people, how do you change their mindsets? Go ahead, Justin. I would say putting solid policies in place would be a good way to kind of change the way that these things operate. 
And in order to enact those policies, you need a strong government to be able to do that. Uh, it's really, and I don't know, in my experience, in my understanding, it's kind of difficult to just convince someone to do something um, that's different than what's making them a living. And so having solid policies that, you know, benefits the people on the ground and benefit the wildlife and kind of benefit the whole system that would be able to be enforced against some of these larger operators, um, I think would be one of the best ways to, to address that issue. I would just add, Justin, too, that, that I agree with that very much. I, I do think that in, in some respects, um, consumer pressure on brands has been impactful here in the United States, for example, um, and and the nonprofit organizations that have helped to to, to galvanize that's that pressure from young people um, about uh, about what kind of products they want to buy uh, versus the products they don't want to buy. So voting with your wallet is powerful, and then from a legislative point, as, as you said, Justin, it's very important that policy and the way that we build that policy and the will to create that policy is having enough people in society who are demanding that change and, and rewarding politicians for making those changes. And that's really where you all come in who are watching today. Um, you know, one of the things I encourage all of us to be are ambassadors for, for endangered species, ambassadors for these animals. Um, talk about them, uh, go home and talk to your parents about them. And remember that when we are uh, at the polls or when, when if we can't vote, when our parents or our, or our siblings, um, our friends, um, to, to be thinking about the environment. We have to demand of our politicians um, that they care about conservation in the environment, regardless of party and political affiliation. And, and so that that really comes down to the power that you all have. Believe me, the power that you have, no matter how old you are, um, to have an influence on the choices that happen in, in the countries. And then in places like Canada, in the United States and other countries that can then help to put pressure on Indonesia and places like that. And the corporations that are taking action uh, or not taking action to support conservation. Um, so all of it fits together, but the root of that, the key of that is you and being actively engaged and and um, uh, taking uh, making your voice heard. I think that's really, really important. All right, absolutely. I love uh, those points, Philippe. Is, you know, students, I think, sometimes think that they're maybe too small or their voice can't be heard, but that couldn't be further from the truth. And everybody you tell is one more person who can pass that message on. And supporting right. organizations, you know, like Planet Indonesia, um, our other partner, World Wildlife Fund. I mean, these kinds of organizations are doing tr tremendous work. And so, you know, doing fundraisers, doing events at your school, uh, adopting orangutans virtually, you know, whatever it is, you can also help support the kinds of organizations that are doing this critical work on the ground. That's another really important thing. All right, Mr. Magnaughton's grade sixes, if you're there. Uh, there we go. How are we doing? Good. We have uh, Peyton and Brody here who'd like to ask a, a double question. You can go ahead. Um, uh, how did, um, uh, I have a question for Justin. How did you get into this type of job? I ask yours too. And this question is for both of you. Have you guys ever been hurt by an orangutan? So both good questions. Um, I can answer the second question really easily. No, I have not. But Justin, you go for the others. I'll answer the second one as well. No, <laughs> I have not. They are, they're very delicate, very careful by the way that they move. They're not reckless. And so, you know, I had never had an issue when I was out in the field with them. Uh, for, the first, for the first question, um, that's a really good question. So I started my career off as a wildlife biologist. And I was working with reptiles out in the field and doing all kinds of really cool research on them. Uh, but as I was doing that, I would bring cameras out with me and uh, come back and write and blog and do little videos and stuff about the animals that I was working with. And that kind of really propelled me in an interest of uh, starting a career in science communication. So science communication is really, you know, using film, photos, poetry, art, how whatever talent you have. Um, to help bolster um, science, to like get that information out to the public so that people understand what's going on with various scientific projects or conservation. So I, I focused my work on wildlife because I have that interest in wildlife, that experience studying wildlife. And so everything that I kind of do now really fits within that science communication avenue where 
I'm making films, I'm doing virtual presentations about animals, I'm taking photos, I'm making websites about wildlife, doing exhibitions, um, all that kind of stuff, all these all these different ways to really just dance around educating the public about the importance of living with wildlife and how to build a sustainable future. So that's kind of how I got in, in a, in a nutshell. It's pretty difficult, um, but if you're persistent and you know, you're, you're really, re really willing to be patient, um, you can have a very rewarding career as a, as a photographer, a science communicator, or a filmmaker. And, and, and you can start now, I think is the key, right? I mean, these days, I know Justin, when Justin and I were both young, uh, we didn't have these things, right? We didn't have the ability to shoot high def video. And I'll tell you, um, you know, we talk about endangered species like orangutans, we've done something on pangolins and polar bears, and these animals are far away, uh, probably from where most of you live, but there are endangered species in your communities as well. There are, we, we, we lose 1,000, 1,500 animals a year to extinction. So, um, you know, you don't have to go to Borneo to find endangered species or animals that are threatened. So there are stories in your backyard, animals, extraordinary animals, lots of issues in North America around pollinators and bees and things like that, uh, for example, something that we're all encountering every day. And so you can be a storyteller about all of these different kinds of animals. So if you like writing or if you like making little videos or whatever it is for social media, um, you can be a storyteller uh, and you can be somebody that's a champion for these animals right now. And that has a huge impact um, on, on people around the world. And as you build up that portfolio, then that's the kind of thing, that experience that can then help you pursue that kind of career down the road. But you don't have to wait till you get older. You can start right now to be a champion for animals and for wildlife. Absolutely. Good stuff. Let's go to Kitchener in Canada, Kitchener, Ontario. Let's bring in some more grade sixes. How are we doing grade sixes? Good. Hi, I have a question for Justin. Do orangutans fight with each other? And if they do, do they apologize after? <laughs> they should, shouldn't they? Um, occasionally the males will um, get into territorial disputes. Mostly that is prevented by the calls that they do. So the louder, the more robust the call is, chances are that that's a really strong, hefty male. Uh, and another challenging male will probably avoid that area. Uh, you know, occasionally they will, um, but when there is a winner, they will just kind of go their separate ways. And that in itself, I guess, is sort of an apology. <laughs> They'll just move, move away from each other. All right. I want to squeeze in one more question from YouTube. Uh, they noticed the fur seems really long. Is there a purpose for the, that long fur? I would imagine that the fur is extremely helpful in allowing water to kind of wick away from the body as well as protect them from the amount of bugs that are out there in um, Indonesia. There are just an extreme amount of parasites. There's land leeches, there's mosquitoes, there's all kinds of fun and exciting things. And I would imagine that fur also kind of helps keep that off of them. But um, I'm sure there's other reasons too. I don't know if uh, Philippe has any ideas or... I think that's right. Uh, it helps yeah. them keep, keep dry, keeps the insects off, and probably helps protect them from scratches and things like that as they're as they're moving through the uh, through the forest with broken sticks and branches yeah. and things like that. Yeah, and they have incredible fur. I mean, there's there's males that you'll see that are like 40 years old, and they'll just have like feet of fur hanging from um, their arms, and it's really cool to kind of see they can like kind of completely hide themselves off with just this big blanket of fur um, when it's raining or something like that. So it's pretty cool. All right. Very cool. I want to show a few links here. If you want to dive a little deeper into Justin's work, uh, you can check out some of uh, uh, the documentaries and some really cool videos here. Uh, I also want to spotlight um, Philippe and his awesome youth organization, so earthecho.org. Uh, you can check out some of the activities uh, and future events and things like that. And then Philippe, uh, endangered.com. What kind of stuff can students find there? Well, you can find out uh, where you can get the book. You can also uh, register for more of the webinars we have coming up here. We've still got uh, black-footed ferrets ahead and narwhals, the unicorns of the sea. You can see uh, there also the archive webinars that we've already done on pangolins and, and polar bears. Um, and uh, and there's classroom resources. Uh, and with our partner, WWF, there's a, a special adoption kit that's running out here. There's only a few left. Um, or you get a signed copy of the endangered and a, and a little adoption kit with WWF to support these animals um, and links to, to all the resources at Earth Echo as well um, that, that we have. So uh, lots of fun stuff at, at theendangers.com. 
All right, so I'll spotlight this link uh, one more time before I wrap up for today. There are two more events coming up on the 17th uh, with Narwhals. Uh, I believe that's 12 p.m. Eastern and then at 2 p.m. Eastern on the 19th uh, with WWF and Black Footed Ferret. So that should be pretty awesome. Everybody who joined us on YouTube today, thank you for those amazing questions. Um, sorry we couldn't get to them all, but there's just so many great ones that were coming in. A shout out to all our camera classrooms. Thank you so much for being here with us uh, and welcoming us into your classrooms and homes. And then Justin, thank you. Great to great to see you. Uh, great to see the spotlight on our organization doing uh, such great work to help protect orangutans. Yeah, it was great being here and love chatting about orangutans. All right. Well, Philippe, good to see you. And uh, Such a we will see always. you. Yeah, we'll see you again on the 17th. I hope we see all the classrooms coming back uh, for another round of the endangered and real life conservation. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Justin, your wonderful, extraordinary work. Everybody, check out Planet Indonesia and all of Justin's work online, please. Uh, it's so, so important we come together at this time in the world right now and, and make, a, make a positive future for us all. All right. Signing off for today. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much.